I'm excited to be with you this weekend. Um, this is a special series called Pressing On, and it really is kind of a, a swan song here as I come to the point of retirement. Um, some things that God's really laid on my heart, and I really wish I could be with each of you personally, um, but because I've been sick this week, um, we decided it'd be better to do a recording. So I just want to share some things that are on my heart, and and I, I want to use the imagery that life is like a journey. And in fact, I would say it's like a hike. And there are times in that journey when you come to a, a, a vista, a point to where you can kind of look back and look ahead and sort of look out over the scenery. And at this point in our ministry, and this point in the life of Family Church, we're kind of at a, at a point where we can say, let's look back. And you, you sometimes look back over the trail behind you, and you can remember those grueling climbs and maybe the boggy places where you went through a stream and, and some places where it was just pleasant and beautiful. And, and you look back and you remember the difficulty, but you're, you're at a point where you can look out and see all that's come out of that. And then we turn and we, we look up the path ahead. And I have to tell you that, that I'm excited about what God has for Family Church. I'm excited about what God has for Jan and I. Um, I believe that He has called us to pouring in to young leaders. And I, I have every intention of writing a book and and continuing involvement in ministry. And, and it's wonderful that we are not leaving Family Church. We're going to disappear for two or three months just to let everybody get established in a, in a new way. And then, and then we'll be back. And this will be our church family. And we have not lost our relationships. But I want to I wanna think about what it means to hike. And it's like a little bit like every time you take a step, whether you think about it or not, you know, when you're a little kid and you're learning how to walk, it's pretty difficult. Now it becomes second nature, but you have to lean forward and you have to let go of your back foot so you can take another step. And in that kind of imagery, um, the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn there. And he kind of gives this picture of letting go of what's in behind us and pressing on towards what ahead, is ahead of us. And I want to give you a little bit of backstory. Um, Paul had poured into the Philippians. He cared about them a great deal. And after he had gone, um, there were some other leaders that came in, and they kind of began to to cut Paul down, talk about the fact that he wasn't that great of a guy. And they kind of held up their pedigree as Jewish religious scholars. And so Paul, um, he kind of has to lean in, and this is a little unusual for him, but but he kind of does some bragging. And you can tell he's uncomfortable with it. But he says, if you want to match resumes, here's my past. And so I'm going to start reading in Colossians, or excuse me, Philippians 3, and chapter, chapter 3, verse 4b, really. Paul says, if someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. I kind of feel like there should be some like background music playing, like this is a bum -ba bum And then he says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, and I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. So he, he gives his resume, and then he says, you know what? It, it doesn't matter a bit compared to what it means to know Christ and to grow in him. And then he goes on down, and these are the verses that I kind of want us to focus on this morning. And in, in chapter uh, 3, verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained all this. He talks about pressing on towards the future, towards what God has called us to. And he says, I want you to know that I don't think I've arrived and I think that's a very important statement. If the Apostle Paul, towards the end of his ministry, had not arrived, then I certainly know that I haven't. It, it's a danger, I think, as we grow in our maturity as a Christian, to, to start thinking, well, that's for the newbies. That's for people who haven't been here very long. That's, 
that's not for me. I've got this kind of dialed in. I, I've got this figured out. And Paul says, I don't think I've arrived. I, I, I would say, in fact, that, that that danger of arrival thinking is that you are stuck and stagnant and, in fact, kind of dead in your spiritual journey. So he says, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And then he goes on, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So Paul uses the imagery of running a race, of, of being actively, like almost athletically involved in, in straining towards what God wants for us. And there's this funny balance all the way through the New Testament that, that we can't do anything without the power of the Spirit. Um, you know, Pastor Ed talked last week about that, that we have to abide in the vine and I can do nothing without Him. And so we know that God is the one who works in us. God is the one who works through us. But He still has this, this inner desire and He challenges us to, to have that intensity. So, so let's look at that specific verse again. He said, for this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal. Paul had out there ahead of him this idea that God had called him not only to a series of things that he was going to do, but, but he was visualizing the end of the race where he would stand before the Lord and he would have achieved as much as possible of what God had called him to do. And so there's this very kind of energetic phrase where I strain towards what lies ahead. And I want us to, to think about those two concepts. What does it mean to let go of what's behind you? Forgetting it, he says. In fact, it, earlier in the chapter, he says, I count it as garbage. I, I'm throwing it away. And then he says, and I am pressing forward. And I want you to think as I walk through this, what is it that you're letting go of? I, I'm at a point where I'm thinking about what I'm letting go of. And then what are we pressing toward? What has God called us to? What is, what is still for us to strain towards? And so one of the good things about this is, as I look at letting go of what is behind, I am so glad that what is behind is gone in terms of my sin. I think of what the gospel means and the fact that Jesus provided forgiveness for us. And as I look back in my life, clearly there are times when I got stuck in the journey, when I got distracted, when I got involved in, in things that were sinful. But even more than that, there were just failures. I, I've been going through an exercise. I'm a, I'm a note taker and a note keeper. So I literally have about 10 drawers of uh, files and papers that I have saved and written and, and accumulated over the years. I, I told my mom this is an exercise in repenting of materialism. Um, so I've been going through these notes and looking back, and some of them I just throw away, and some of them, they bring up all these memories of, of conflicts and difficulties. Uh, like looking back at the hike, and you remember, man, we got bogged down there. And, and some of them have been very emotional, just thinking back to, to things I wish I had done differently, places I wish I'd kept my mouth shut, places I wish I'd stepped up and said something, ways in which I... I see now with the, the eyes of, of a 65-year-old to, oh, I wish I could have told this 35-year-old how to be different. And I look back and I think, praise God. God has been able to work and to use me and use us in spite of our failures. But I look back to the past and I say, that's gone. But you know what the other side of that is? Is that my successes are gone too. That's kind of specifically what Paul leans into here. He says, you know, I had all these credentials in my, in my Jewish uh, faith. And he says, I, I saw them as incredibly important. All of these ways in which I had fulfilled the law and been right. And he says, I look at them as garbage. And of course, one of them was Paul had to, to look back and realize that he had persecuted other Christians before he was a Christian. And so he was so glad to be able to say, I can let go of, of the painful, the sinful, the failures. But I also let go of the successes. And he says, 
I, I'm letting go of those in light of that I need to strain towards knowing Christ more, towards seeing what he still has for me to accomplish. And as I look back over our 36 years at Family Church, I am so blessed that there have been so many wonderful moments, that, that the journey has been exciting. And as I look at at how we started as a little dispirited group of 35 people in a, in a small town in Oregon, in rural Oregon, where really the, the percentage of people who are, go to church and who are following Christ is pretty small. And to see what God has done over the years and to see how he has caused Family Church Sutherland to grow and to expand. And, and as we added services and saw the, the, the promise of God coming through in, in building buildings and then the the planting of a campus, which was a dream for years. And now, Green, you've been there for 10 years. And, and God is prospering you in that community of 11,000 people that desperately need Jesus. And then we planted South Umpqua campus. And you haven't been there that many years, but you've been through some real challenges, uh, changes in leadership, changes in buildings. And now God's given you a building of your own. And so you look back and you think also of the of the team that's come together. And, and I say this very, very honestly. I've only played a small part in all of these successes. It is because God has given us a team to work together. And, and I know that more than anybody, that I've played a small part, but nothing could be done without this team that God has brought together. But he says, we're letting go of that. To move on to the next thing, you've got to let go of the last thing. And that's hard. I think it's, it's harder the older you get. In fact, I would say many, many people wait too long to make decisions that are important to make because it's so hard to let go. And as I come to our point of retirement, yeah, there's some heart pangs. This has been my life for 36 years. That This has been Jan and I's burden. And I feel honestly like God has said, Paul, it's now a place that you can hand that off. There's a talented and eager team ready to take it. And, and yet there's those pinches that that think, wow, not only is, is this exciting, but it's kind of nerve-wracking. I'm not sure what the future holds. It's someplace I've never been before. So Paul then says, not only do we forget what is behind, but he said, I want to press on towards what God's calling on my life is. And this is exciting for us. I believe that God has plans for my life and for Jan's life. And, and we are looking forward to what God has for us. And I'm excited that we don't have to lose the relationships we've built in, in this church and in this town for so many years. And I'm excited for family church because I believe that God has the best days of family church ahead of us. And I hope that you will trust that God will do that as well, that you will believe him for that. But I want to share some of the things that I have been reflecting on as I think about pressing ahead. And I believe that it starts, all spiritual change starts when we begin to see things differently. It's our growth in our belief a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Craig asked a really bothersome question. <laughs> I think that's the best messages there are is somebody gives you a question and it just kind of burns in your soul and maybe bothers you for a while. And he said, do you believe what you believe you believe? And I was thinking after that in my own devotions that week. And I, and I, I jotted down some things that I firmly believe. And, and I would say to you, 36 years ago, I would have said, I believe that, but not like I do now. I, I knew that those things were true, these things I'm going to share with you, but I wouldn't have said they controlled and gripped and empowered my life. So I want you to jot these down as we walk through them, and I want you to ask yourself, do I believe these, and how much do I believe them? And so the first one is I believe that Jesus does give abundant life. Jesus in John 10 said, the thief comes to steal and destroy and to kill, and I come to give life and to give it abundantly. And I would say that that's true. I have experienced the abundant life that, that Christ brings. Not only do I have eternity with Christ, but, but the way that he's worked in my life, the, the love and the joy and the patience and the peace that he's worked into me that were not at all native to me. The fact that, that the fruits of the Spirit he's developed in me that that is abundance. And I would also say that he's displayed in me and, and enabled me to see so much that's happened in my life to, to show and say, look what God can do. He has blessed us immensely. 
And and I think of as we talk about that, I, one of the greatest blessings has been in, to be involved in meaningful work here at Family Church, to be doing things that I know matter and last in people's lives, and and to to lean into that and to say that was a gift from God. That's abundant life doesn't mean luxury. It means meaningful processing, deepening growth. I would say the second thing I believe is that God has to work a lot in me so he can work through me. I, I've said that a lot in the years past, but I come to see more and more that, that God has to develop his character in me. And as I allow him to work in me, and I, I'll tell you the discipline of taking the word of God and preaching it regularly has caused me to reflect in my own life. And, and that has pressed me to say, Am I living this out? Is this true? And I, I told you the image before is that the Holy Spirit fills us, but first he has to continually scoop out that ego and that selfishness so that there's room for him to fill me. And God has to show me my self-confidence, my, my ego dependence, my desire to please others, all of those things that, that prevent me from really being useful. And the more God hollows me out, if you will, the more he's able to pour through me. So uh, I've, I've faced a lot of things in ministry. Some of them have been very difficult. I, I think back to times when people got upset about something and left the church. People sat down and had an exit interview with me. And sometimes they were critiquing my style or my ministry or my actions. And it was easy to be, to get that inner lawyer up and to say, no, no, that's not true. But boy, there was a part of it that was true. And as God used those critiques, as he, his spirit began to develop in me, he created a greater humility. And humility is just honesty. It's just realizing what is true about me and what God has to do in me so he can work through me. So do you believe that? The third thing I would add is that everyone has an sp important spiritual role and an important spiritual gift. God has given me some gifts, and from an early age, I, I had people pouring into me and good training, and, and I had the ability to, to think and talk on my feet, and, and those things I could see that God gave to me. And I, I believe that every pastor would say that the, there's a giftedness for everybody in the church family. But honestly, a lot of times churches are built around the giftedness of the key leader. And I have come to believe that teamwork is so important. Ed and I have done shared leadership for the last, well, since 2006. We have switched roles and shared a leadership function together. And God has brought Craig and Heather and Crystal and Jeremy and Drew and Jason and, and our whole team together. And, and each one has a unique gift and a unique perspective. But I'm not just talking about staff. I'm talking about every single one of you have spiritual gifts that God has given you at salvation, and He has a plan and a desire for your life. He has a calling for you. And I believe that the whole body is built up as each part does its work. That's what Ephesians 4 says. And what that means is that if some people are only doing a little bit, or if they're not working at all, involved in the kingdom ministry, then it's like the church is a stroke victim like we're half paralyzed because every part isn't doing its work and every part needs to have input because God can speak through and does speak through all of us. So I believe that now more than I ever did. I also believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, that it's only through God's power inside of us that he's able to open my eyes to see things, to, to nudge me out of stuck places, to bring a genuine sense of not only being forgiven, but the ability to forgive others and to lay aside resentments. The Holy Spirit is the one who directs and leads us as we try to lead a church. And we are, we are hopeless without that. And then I also believe, and have come even more to believe, that the training of a few has more lasting impact than drawing a crowd. In the early days of ministry, I really wanted discipleship and I wanted people to grow, but I have to tell you the growing numbers and growing programs and all those things were too important to me. And I told a friend years ago, 
that the Sunday morning experience is the tip of the iceberg in the church. This isn't the church. This is one little facet of the church. But the church is really made up of incredibly gifted and wonderful people. In fact, when I invite people to family church, I say, you know what? You're going to have a great time there because there are some wonderful people there. That, that God is working in all of us. But over the years, I look at the time that's been spent. And now that one of the greatest accomplishments of family church is that, that a lot of our key leaders have come from within. They've, they've become as the tenders here, and then they become volunteers, and then they became serving part-time, and now they have staff positions. And, and all of that is going to make a ministry that lasts 20, 30, 40 years. And that's so much more important than drawing a crowd. And I think COVID has really underscored this. When we couldn't meet together anymore, boy, so many people kind of got stuck in their journey or fell away or just drifted away. And so that, that Sunday morning experience and just having it the way I like it has become too important to the American church. And then lastly, that Jesus is the only hope of the world. I believe we are in a world that is in a mess, that, that I can't believe people who are raising their kids today and how, how they're going to pilot them through all of the, the stuff that's going on. But I, I think my parents felt the same way. But politics is not going to solve it. Good intentions is not going to solve it. Even just, uh, just trying to come together and sort of make society change in good ways is not going to change it. That people need to have Jesus in their life. They need to have the Holy Spirit. There needs to be that internal change, the transformation that comes from within. And without that, there's no hope. And you know, that's always been true. Sometimes history looks rather dark. But Jesus always has a group of people that he's leading and changing and following. And, and I believe that he's often pouring into a few, just like he did at the beginning with the disciples. And those are going to carry on the ministry for the next generation. So I have grown in my belief. The things that I said I believed, I now, I, I now hold them and they hold me. I remember reading an article and it said that when I see an American pastor, I often see a salesman, not a holy man. Uh, it's been so convicting. And I have wanted God to deepen me and to make me into a holy man so that I could be used for him in this ministry. So he's deepened me in my character and my belief. And then I would say, lastly, we also have to be growing in grit. Now, that may not be a word you read in Philippians, but that's something that Paul talks a lot about. It talks about perseverance because life is messy. You know, when people say, I want to quit church because I got my feelings hurt at church, it's like, oh, yeah, join the group. Who hasn't? Grit really is, what does it take to stop you? You know, I'm afraid that American Christians are way too often like consumers at a restaurant. I'm going to go, and if the service is good, and if the meal is hot, and if it fits my taste buds, then I'll come back. And if not, then I'll go somewhere else. And I believe that's not the picture of the church at all. The picture of the church is supposed to be a committed team of people pouring into each other's lives and serving together to reach a lost and dying world. I believe that we need grit. And it has taken some grit for us to stay here this long. I say this somewhat humorously, but it's kind of true. When people say, how have you stayed so long? I say, I, I stayed when I felt like it, and I stayed when I didn't feel like it. I stayed when they wanted me to, <laughs> and I stayed when they didn't want me to. And in some ways, that's the truth. Um, my dad was a pastor, and we left about every five years, we would leave and go to a different church. And, and I think sort of internally in my own thinking that that was what pastors did. And so after we got to about five or six, seven years here, I began thinking, what's the next thing? And where's God going to lead us? And I went to a seminar where they were challenging us that if we had a good fit with the body we were with, that we should think about staying there 25 years. That was a brand new idea to me. And yet God put that on my heart and said, I think he want you to stay here. And of course, I've surpassed that 25 years, but I think it's so important because 
The future is going to be messy. It's going to be difficult. The, the path ahead of us is going to be based on the path behind us. We know there's going to be some swamps and bogs and tough climbs and maybe some cliffs. That it's going to be brutal, <laughs> brutal and beautiful. And that we need people who have grit. It's easy for people to come to a church based on the, the fact that it's got great programs that I like the way they do kids ministry or youth or, or what they've got for the women or the men based on the, the people involved. I've got friends there. And so my, my family is here and we come together and, and based on the, what people would just say, I like being in that place. It's a beautiful building. It's, it's close. And then the fourth one is based on the personality. And often it's the key personality of, of the speaker or a key leader. And those are what we call the lower story. People come in because of the lower story. But if you are growing in grit, I would hope that you would say, I want to be at family church because the mission of people helping people find and follow Jesus is vital. That that's what our world needs. And I want to be a part of that. That's, that's exciting. And I want, to, I want to use my gifts and my abilities. I want to be part of that team. And if the going gets tough, if the hike is difficult, I'm going to be one of the ones that's pressing in to say, let's keep straining forward. And I don't know if that's your heart, but Craig said something kind of interesting here a couple of weeks ago. He said, it's kind of sad that some people are saying, when Paul leaves, I'm going to leave as well. He said, if Paul was on a trip somewhere and died in an airplane wreck, man, the body would come together and say, we need to fill in the gaps and we need to get through this crisis and we need to be a team together. Why wouldn't it be the same if somebody retires? Why wouldn't it be the same? So my challenge to you is to ask you what you believe and are you growing in that belief? And we're going to have to let go of what's behind. And that's often painful and difficult and there's some pinch to that. But God wants us to embrace what's ahead of us. And I believe for Jan and I, the retirement for ministry does not mean a funeral for mission that God has called us to serve together and to serve Him. And, I, and I'm excited to see what that's going to happen, that, what that's going to look like. But I believe that God has called you, and I believe Family Church needs you to step in and to find out what your gifts are and to, to grow in your faith and in your character and in your grit so that it takes a whole lot to stop you. So thankful for those of you who are watching online from whatever location you're in. And, and I want you to think about all the things that I've talked about, what God has caused me to growth in belief and that growth in grit. And I want to ask you, what is God calling you to in this season? And I know COVID has disrupted a lot of life. I know that some of you are spread geographically. I believe this is an incredibly important question because God is calling you to pour in your gifts, your talents, your finances, your your way of, of life to pour into the mission of Jesus. And I can't tell you what that looks like for you, but I hope that you will ask yourself, have I gotten stuck in the journey? Have I gotten stagnant? Have I, have I thought that I've arrived? And that you would leave what's behind, both the successes and the failures, and you would press on to what God has for you so that when you get to the end of your life, the Lord says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've done well with what I invested in you. That's what I hope for myself, and I hope that for you as well. Paul said when he got to the end of his race, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I've, I've run the race. And I hope that you can say the same. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for those who are listening. And I don't know what the circumstances of their life are, but I know that you are wanting to work in each one of us and that you are wanting to use our gifts and our abilities to not only draw close and to love you more, to grow more, but to be involved in your mission and to let what you're doing in us be something that overflows into what you're doing through us. And so I pray that you would give clarity to each one who's listening of what you're calling them to do and that they would strain towards what lies ahead. In Jesus' name. Amen.